So what we're going to do now is going to breach and make entry. Across the side, keeping the wall. It's going well. Oh, great. Well, total success. Good morning from Athens, Greece. I am here at St. Photonis Church in downtown Athens. It is around 10 o'clock on this Sunday morning. Let's talk about some news and let's do an update as to what's going on in Odessa at the Odessa port. We had uh, four missiles strike the Odessa port. Actually, from what I read, two missiles were uh, taken out by, uh, by air defense systems. Two missiles got through. The damage from what I've been reading was minimal and uh, there were no casualties at the port. Nonetheless, this missile strike occurred 24 hours after Russia, Ukraine, Turkey and the United Nations all agreed on um, on resolving the wheat and grain issue with regards to Odessa. They all signed up to, uh, to a memorandum which stated that the port of Odessa would not come under any military uh, activity for 120 days, while the, the area outside of Odessa was demined and ships were allowed to transport the port, to transport the, uh, the wheat and grain out of Odessa under the uh, supervision of Turkey with the joint command center in Istanbul. And um, Sergei Shoigu, Sergei Lavrov, they, uh, they signed off on this. Sergei Shoigu made a statement where he said that Russia would be committed to this agreement and would not conduct any military activity towards the port of Odessa. That's a key point to the port of Odessa for 120 days. After 120 days, the, uh, the memorandum, the agreement could be extended and renewed. But you had all of this, uh, this agreement in place and everything seemed like it was resolved with this whole uh, wheat cannot leave the port of Odessa um, story. And then you had 24 hours later, you had this missile strike on the port of Odessa. The Ukraine side of things, the office of President Zelensky, according to a statement from the AFP, they have reported that the office of President Zelensky condemns the attack they accused Russia of routinely violating agreements after Moscow forces bombed, Saturday bombed the Odessa port. Key to a grain export deal the warring parties signed today earlier. That is a statement coming from Ukraine. They are blaming Russia and they're saying that Russia did this missile strike 24 hours after they signed an agreement saying they would not strike out at the port of Odessa. The U.S. Secretary of State. Anthony Blinken said that uh, the United States strongly condemns Russia's attack on the port of Odessa just 24 hours after finalizing a deal to allow the resumption of Ukrainian agricultural products through the Black Sea. Russia breached its commitments by attacking the historic port from which grain and agricultural exports would again be transported under this agreement, according to Anthony Blinken. On the Russian side of things, the Kremlin has not issued a formal statement as of yet, but uh, the, the Turkish Defense Ministry, this is from the Turkish Defense Ministry, not from uh, the Kremlin or Russia. The Turkish Defense Ministry says it has discussed with its Russian counterparts the shelling of the port of Odessa this morning. As stated in Turkey, the Russian side denied involvement in the incident. Now, the Turkish defense minister, Hulusi Akar, he made some statements on Saturday with regards to the, uh, the deal that had been made between all parties, mediated by Turkey, and he also talked about the, uh, the missile strike on the Odessa port. Akar told Anadolu Agency that representatives of Russia and Ukraine, as well as of the United Nations, have now started to work together with Turkey at the Joint 
Coordination Center. The uh, defense minister said the fact that the incident, the missile strike on Odessa, took place right after the agreement we made yesterday regarding the grain shipment has really worried us and we are disturbed by this. However, we continue to fulfill our responsibilities in the agreement. And the minister also revealed, and this is a quote from the Turkish defense minister, Russians told us that they had absolutely nothing to do with this attack and that they were examining the affair very closely and in detail. The United Nations has condemned the strikes on the Odessa port. They said, quote, yesterday, all parties made clear commitments on the global stage to ensure the safe movement of Ukrainian grain and related products to global markets. This is according to Farhan Haq, the spokesman for the UN Secretary General Antonio Gutierrez. And he added that the grain products are desperately needed to address the global food crisis and ease the suffering of millions of people in need around the globe. So that's pretty much where we are with regards to this incident that took place at the port of Odessa 24 hours after the parties agreed that they would not um, go after the port of Odessa. Ukraine says Russia did it. The United States, of course, says Russia did it. I'm sure the EU will come out with statements and Burrell will come out with statements saying the Russians did it. The Turkish Ministry of Defense says that they spoke with Russia and Russia says they did not do it. And Russia has not issued any um, official statements as of yet. Well, as I am recording this video, the Kremlin has not issued an official statement with regards to the, um, to the missile strike at this Odessa port. That is where we are. My own opinion on this, actually there are some analysts who have come out with some opinions as well. And let me get to those. But my own opinion on this is uh, we're going to have to wait and see. <laughs> we're going to have to wait and see uh, what, what an investigation comes up with. Turkey says that they're going to investigate this. According to the Turkish defense minister, he is saying that the Russians are also looking into this. Once again, this is according to the Turkish defense minister who claims that he spoke with his uh, Russian counterparts. But uh, outside of an investigation, we're not going to know exactly what happened. I find it very strange, very unlike the Russians, for them to, um, to sign an agreement with Turkey, with the United Nations, with Sergei Shoigu's name attached to it, with uh, Sergei Lavrov's name attached to it with a statement from Sergei Shoigu on the record saying that Russia will not uh, make any moves on the port of Odessa for 120 days and then for the Russians to send missiles towards Odessa port. It's very, uh, it's very odd behavior from the Russians. The Russians, when these high-level officials like Sergei Shoigu or Lavrov, when they make these statements or put their their signature to these memorandums, Russia abides by these uh, these agreements. So, what could be going on? Well, there's a couple of scenarios. These are just various scenarios. I'm sure there's a lot of different um, opinions as to what happened. Let me give you some scenarios that I read. The first scenario is that Russia did indeed hit the ports because they just don't care anymore. They don't care about agreements that they sign. They don't care about any agreements being made with Ukraine or the collective West. And the Russians are kind of acting in a manner which is, you know, we can do whatever we want. And if we want to hit the ports, we'll hit the ports because we're out of the, uh, the system. We're not uh, a part of the, the international system anymore. I've read analysis like this. I've read analysis which has said that... Uh, that Ukraine has done this as a provocation. I've read that type of analysis. I've read analysts saying these were kind of rogue military units in Ukraine. 
I've read analysis saying these were kind of rogue uh, military units in Russia that sent these missiles to the port. I've read analysis which has also said that the Russians hit at the port because uh, they wanted to send the message that just because we have this memorandum in place for 120 days doesn't mean that Ukraine and NATO can, uh, can start operating in and around the port and start preparing provocations towards Russia. They can't use the port. In other words, they can't use the port as some sort of safe haven now so that they can start sending weapons into the area and start, um, and start preparing for, for attacks under the cover and under the protection of, the, of this agreement towards, uh, towards Russia. So the Russians kind of wanted to send a message that just because we have this agreement doesn't mean that you can start um, operating under the protection of this agreement. So I've read analysis like this as well. And... Uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. We're going to have to wait and see for an investigation. You know, I don't... What, what I do know, what I do know is that I condemn statements like those being made from Secretary of State Blinken. Without any investigation coming out and right away saying that Russia did it. The Collective West does this all the freaking time. They've been doing this with, uh, I remember, during Syria during the conflict in Syria. They were doing this all the time. Um, Iraq, they were doing this all the time. Libya, they were doing this all the time. Whenever there's some sort of, uh, of an attack or something that happens which needs an investigation to take place, which needs a couple of days, perhaps even a couple of weeks to get to the bottom of, the uh, Collective West, what they do is they come out with a statement right away they say this person is to blame. Then they have the social media and the, uh, the mainstream media um, disseminate, distribute that, uh, that narrative from the State Department or from the Pentagon, and it becomes fact. And then a week or two later, you find out that it wasn't the way that the Pentagon or the State Department said it was. And by that time, you know, it's it's all, we've already moved on to the next uh, news topic, and, and that's that. So I really hate the way the, uh, the State Department plays these tricks and comes out with a statement right away without any kind of investigation into this incident and automatically blames, uh, blames the Russians. Or, or in the time of Syria, would automatically blame Assad or automatically blame... Gaddafi or Saddam or whatever. I mean, it's this is just a trick that they play over and over again. Let's wait for an investigation. Let's see what happens. If the Russians did it, let's uh, let's listen to why they did it. Let's hear why they did it. If this was some other uh, provocation or kind of rogue units or rogue incident that happened, I don't know. Um, then then so be it. The, uh, the point that, uh, that we need to understand is that, uh, according to the Turkish defense minister, all parties are now working together to, uh, to implement the agreement. And that is coming from Turkey, that all parties are now at this command center and they're working together to implement the, uh, the one memorandum that they all signed up to. And, um, and an investigation of this attack will take place. No casualties, minimal damage, and uh, we'll leave it there. With that being said, let's now talk about Alensky and Jake Sullivan. So Sullivan was speaking at um, a conference, the Aspen, the Aspen Security Conference, which is a conference for like intelligence officials and CIA guys and all these types of, uh, of spooks. And uh, this was the conference where the CIA director Burns said that Vladimir Putin is too healthy. He's too healthy, which is a very troubling statement coming from the CIA. And uh, you had Sullivan speak at this conference as well. And Sullivan came out with uh, this statement with regards to Ukraine President Alensky's well-being, and Jake Sullivan is 
the U.S. National Security Advisor. He is a Clintonite. He is part of the Clinton machine. Um, a neo, I would say he's kind of like a neocon, Clint, Clintonista. And he was put in the White House at the behest of the Clinton machine. And uh, he's, he, he occupies pretty much the most important um, national security position in the Biden White House. And he said this with regards to Alensky's well-being. He said, President Alensky's personal safety is something that concerns us. This is a leader in wartime dealing with an enemy in Russia that is ruthless, brutal, and capable of just about anything. President Alensky takes the precautions you would expect to protect himself. But Sullivan added that the U.S. is helping to facilitate the Ukrainian leader's security without elaborating. So replace the word Russia with uh, three-letter agencies, three-letter U.S. agencies, and uh, I think you start to get the idea that uh, Alensky should be very, very worried for his uh, well-being. Whenever someone like Sullivan says that Alensky's personal safety is something that concerns us, wink, wink, nudge, nudge at the Aspen Security Forum, and then he says that this is a leader in wartime dealing with an enemy in Russia, replace Russia, dealing with an enemy in the three-letter agencies that is ruthless, brutal, and capable of just about anything, you start to understand that there may be some talk about uh, about removing President Zelensky, and this talk may be taking place amongst these, uh, these deep state three-letter agencies and neocon Clinton... Clinton fanboys like Jake Sullivan. So if I was Zelensky, I would be very, very worried. We have all kinds of palace intrigue that took place the other week with regards to the firing of, uh, of various officials in the Justice, uh, Justice Department of Ukraine, the firing of Zelensky's campaign manager and childhood friend at... Uh, the security services at the SBU, and then the firing had to be walked back, and Alensky said it wasn't a firing, it was just a suspension. Obviously, Alensky was uh, was vetoed by higher-up decision-making forces in, uh, in D.C. Either way, you have a lot of what appears to be a lot of, uh, a lot of panic and worry and palace entry taking place in Kiev, and now you have this statement from Sullivan saying, yeah, you know, we worry about uh, Alensky's security and well-being, and it would be really bad if somehow the Russians did something to Alensky to uh, to take him out. And, um, you know, the Russians, if they really wanted to get to Alensky, they would have gotten to Alensky on day one. They know where he is at all times, and they would have taken him out on day one of the uh, special military operation, but they don't want to take out Alensky. They want the West to build up Alensky as the legitimate leader of Ukraine because they want Alensky to sit at the table and sign the, uh, the surrender slash ceasefire agreement. Alensky will give legit legitimacy to that agreement. No one in the collective West will be able to say that uh, Ukraine should not abide by a surrender or ceasefire agreement if Alensky was to sign it because the collective West has built up Alensky as the ultimate, all-powerful, all-knowing leader of, uh, of Ukraine. So the Russians want him alive. Plus the Russians, I believe, in a kind of cynical way, the Russians actually like Alensky as president because he's, he's such a clown and he makes so many errors that benefit the Russians on, uh, on a military level, on, uh, on a foreign policy level. He makes so many mistakes and he's such a clownish figure that the Russians kind of prefer Alensky to be president. So, you know, obviously the Russians don't want to take out Alensky, but this statement from Sullivan signals to me that uh, something is, is not right. Something is not right. And, you know, I think to myself, 
What would be the best way for the Biden White House to get an off ramp out of Ukraine? In other words, to not have Ukraine be an even bigger embarrassment than Afghanistan, to not do the damage to the United States, to the U.S. military, to the U.S. military industrial complex that Afghanistan did. What is the best off ramp for the Biden White House to accomplish this? They know that the Russians have won. They know the Russians are winning. They know the Ukraine government's going to collapse. They know this Ukraine policy has failed on all levels, military and economic. And uh, the one thing they want to avoid is that Afghanistan moment. You know, that crowds rushing the airport, jumping on planes, the U.S. military leaving. They, 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 they want those pictures. They don't want pictures like that again. You know, what was it? 80, 80 billion in weapons left behind. They don't want those, uh, those images um, going around in Ukraine like they went around in Afghanistan. So what's the best way for them to, to get a nice, a nice uh, off-ramp out of this? You know, deal with... Uh, with Zelensky, blame it on the Russians. And then when uh, the country is plunged into chaos, the collective West can say, look, we tried, but the Russians, they did a horrible act against Zelensky. And now the country is in chaos because of the Russians and what they did to Zelensky. And well, you know, there's nothing much we can do. The Russians have to deal with it now because they're the ones that created this mess. I can definitely see something like that at play. I'm not saying it's going to happen. I'm not saying that uh, that Sullivan and, and Burns and all these, uh, these CIA guys at the Aspen Security Summit are going to follow through on what they may be, may be thinking, what they may be floating out there with regards to Alensky's security and safety. But, you know, the fact that they're talking about this means that you know, it could be something that's in the works, and this may be an idea that is being floated around at the uh, in and around the Biden White House. So this is the an abandoned pool. Been like this forever. It's a real shame because it's like a nice, it could be a nice like swimming pool area, but. It's been abandoned and it's been like this for, for years, right in the center of the city too. Anyway, so that's the news with regards to Sullivan and uh, they know they're losing. They know this is going to be a major, major embarrassment for the collective West when the Russians uh, do decide to, to close the door on Ukraine and Colonel Douglas McGregor, he's, uh, he's made many, many statements now saying that uh, the Russians are preparing for something big where they shut the door on this entire Ukraine conflict once and for all. And uh, the best way to, to avoid an embarrassment would be to create some sort of chaotic condition in Ukraine and then just say, look, we're, you know, what can we do? The Russians caused some chaos and now, you know, look what they've done and we tried our best. See you later. We're out. I, I can definitely see something like that. Once again, I'm not saying it's going to happen. I don't have any any other information other than the statements from Sullivan, but just a scenario to throw out there. Let me know what you think if it's uh, if this is a crazy scenario or if uh, this is a possible a possible uh, off ramp scenario that uh, the Biden White House is, is is thinking of. With that said, let's talk about the statements coming out of Orban, and we'll do a very very good clown world courtesy of Boris Johnson. But Orban has come out with some very interesting statements. Actually, Orban is warning the collective West that uh, a new world order has arrived. Orban argued that the decision to impose sanctions on Moscow and supply Kiev with heavy weapons de facto turned the EU and NATO member states into participants in the conflict, but ultimately yielded no results. Orban, in a speech in the Romanian city of Bale Tuznad on Saturday, said, Instead, today we are sitting inside a car with flat tires on all four wheels. The world is not only, is not only with us, 
but it is demonstratively not with us, Orban said. Orban also said, we must try to persuade the West to develop a new strategy. He later added that the conflict will end when the Americans and the Russians come to an agreement, not the Russians and the Ukrainians. Uh, the Americans and the Russians, so Orban is pretty much saying the quiet parts out loud, which is that this is a war not between Russia and Ukraine. This is a war between Russia, NATO, the collective West, and specifically the Americans. And we will only get peace and a ceasefire, according to Orban, when the Americans and the Russians sit at the negotiating table. The other very interesting quote from Orban was saying that uh, the entire world is not with the collective West. It is without a doubt demonstratively, he said, it is demonstratively against the collective West. So the entire narrative that you always hear, which is the world is against Russia and Russia is isolated, Orban is saying the quiet part out loud and admitting to the fact that the entire world outside of Europe, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, the United States, the rest of the world is with Russia and the rest of the world is against NATO and the collective West. That is what Orban is saying in this statement. Um, let me pull up some more quotes with regards to, uh, to what Orban said. There's a nice uh, Twitter thread that I want to find and, and read it out because, wow, wow, did Orban let loose. And uh, good, it's about time someone in the European Union said it like it is, said some truth. Let's see, this is a tweet thread from Zoltan Kovac. According to Oban, a new multipolar system is rising. The Chinese, the Indians, the Brazilians, South Africa, the Arab world, most of Africa is not willing to participate in this war, not because the truth is not where the West is, but because they have their own problems to deal with and solve. The ability of the Americans to call on people to side with the good guys, that's gone. And the Ukrainians are not winning the war against the Russians. Sanctions will not tip the balance in Russia. Europe is economic. Europe is in an economic and political crisis. Many governments have fallen and we're in autumn and the world is not with us, but demonstratively not with us. Those are some more highlights from um, what Orban said during his speech on Saturday. Orban dropping a lot of truth bombs there, a whole bunch of truth bombs. So a lot of uh, interesting news. <laughs> took place on Saturday. Wow, what a packed news day, but it would not be complete without a clown world. And this clown world is courtesy of the king of clowns, who is Boris Johnson. And uh, this, is, this is a great one <laughs> from Boris Johnson. So the, the prime minister on his way out, and most likely to be succeeded by, God help us, Liz Truss, perhaps Rishi Sunak, but I think Liz Truss. <laughs> um, well, he decided to uh, give us one more clown world and he decided to go training with, uh, <laughs> I can't believe this, with Ukrainian troops in, uh, in the UK. <laughs> and he took photos and everything Boris Johnson decides to go training with UK troops. <laughs> Boris Johnson took part in exercises in North Yorkshire, throwing a grenade and testing an anti-tank missile launcher. On Saturday, Johnson tweeted out a video showing him in full camouflage as he tested out various weapons, including an anti-tank missile launcher and grenade machine gun. He is also seen throwing a grenade. Quote, this week I visited Ukrainian troops being trained by British Armed Forces in North Yorkshire, the Prime Minister said, adding in the video that he had met 
some of the 400 Ukrainian troops who are being trained by UK forces as part of a huge initiative. The program, which was announced during Johnson's visit to Kiev last month, provides for the training of up to 10,000 service members in the coming months. <laughs> so Boris Johnson has given us one more clown world. Him running around and pretending to be um, a soldier boy. I would actually say that uh, Boris should, after the training is done, Boris should should put his uh, should put the training to the test, and perhaps go to the Donbass and see if uh, if the training works. <laughs> How about that? That would be interesting. I think that would be a real uh, a real interesting experiment. If Boris is so confident that the uh, that the military training, the UK military training of Ukrainian troops is so good, I think Boris should go to the front lines for a couple of days and see how those uh, those grenades are going to to work out for him. <laughs> anyway, that's the video, guys. I'm going to end it there. TheDuran.locals.com, Rumble, Odyssey, BitChute, and Telegram. Look for me on those platforms and check out Alexandra's channel. Check out the Durant's channel. Opa. Actually, one sec. There you go. Take care.